want to praise God for for saving me, for delivering me, for setting me free. Come on. Yes. God has brought me through oh, so much. Come on. Yes. Um, Paul kind of gouged me toward a certain testimony, but there's something that I can't get away from. Um, today I was in my car, and I was going down the road, and my work situation here lately has been horrible. You know, there's times where you just go through something and it seems like it's just a mental there battle that you can't get away from. Yep. And I was in, in the car and I was going down the road and I was crying because just the first two hours had been so stressful. I said, God, I can't go through this anymore. Come on. And God spoke to me and he said, are you going through it? <laughs> and I, I said, God, yes, I told you I can't go through this. Oh, that's good. And he said, that's but good. you're not going down. Well, amen. He said, you're not going up. Ooh. He said, I'm taking you down. Yeah. And he started speaking to me. The word of God in 1 Corinthians, it's chapter 10 and verse 13, says, I have made a way to escape. Yeah, that's it. Right. Amen. Yeah. And God started speaking to my heart. And he said, listen. He says, so many times people are in such a rush to hit a button to try to escape out of their situation, expecting God to just swoop down and take them out well, prematurely. Well, yeah. And God started saying, you know what? Everybody wants to get to the promised land, but they don't want to walk through the yeah, desert. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And there's times that we have to stay in that desert. They were in that desert for 40 years. It's supposed Amen. to be like a week, week and a half journey. Yeah. And they were there for 40 Walking years. You know why? Yeah. Because God couldn't take them in in the shape they were in. That's well, right. Amen. And God started speaking to my heart. He said, I have you in this place. He said, you have to trust me that I'm going to keep you yes. where I have you, not keep you as in hold you down, but keep you as in hold you up. Yeah. While you're in that place, he said, and in this time of testing, in this time of trial, he said, prepare your heart to receive, prepare your mind to look, prepare your eyes to see and your ears to hear that when you do, when I do make that way of escape, you come out better than what you were when you went in. And I just praise God this time. We are desperate for a word and we come to church and we're thinking, I hope that preacher calls me out so I can get a word from God. Well, well. Let me tell you something. His word might fail. That's right. Yes. Well, Some other preacher might miss it. That's right. But when you hear directly from hey, the hey, Lord, hey, God, hey, God, hey, God, hey, God, hey, God, and I just praise God and he wanted me to also tell him another time that God brought me through. Hallelujah. And I think I've shared this here before, but That's I was okay. bound with a spirit of suicide and a spirit of depression. Mm. And a lot of people, you hear people talk about that this day and age, people are losing their minds. Well, yeah. That is Satan's biggest stronghold, <coughs> right, I believe, right now, is people are losing their Amen. minds. Right. Yes. If you look at what's went on in New York, what's went on in Texas, it's insanity above all else. Come on. Yeah. People are losing yeah. their minds. Right. Yes. And at the time that I was, I was 10 years old, a spirit of depression latched onto my life. And Satan had a claw in my mind. He was wanting to make me insane. Come on. He was wanting to drive me crazy. He was wanting me, we say it all the time, as, as country people losing our ever-loving mind. <laughs> That's exactly what Satan sought out to do to me. Yeah. To make me lose my mind. Right. And then at 10 years old, I began to do things that I would lock myself in my room. For hours on end. If you have a teenager, if you have a niece, if you have a nephew that spends all their time in their room and won't come out, pray for that child. Oh, Take those doors off those hinges. Well, Make them come out yeah, of that dungeon. Yeah. Because what I did at only 10 years old was to put cardboard up on my window so no sunlight could even come in. Mm. I would lay in bed day and night. Of course, I'd get up and go to school, come home, and go to bed. Because I didn't want to live. Come on. And the thing was, is I grew up in church. I wasn't somebody that was out there doing drugs. I was in the church. Come on, come on. I was on the praise and worship team. Right. I was in the drama team. Right. I didn't sing back then, but I played flute. And I was involved in the ministry. But I went home and I would pray, God, if you love me, you won't wake me up. Because my, my mind was so bombarded by the hounds of hell that I couldn't shake it. I knew of God, yeah. but my life denied his power. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Oh, that's good. I have oh. been in prayer line after prayer line and, 
and people who were anointed of God yeah. would pray and say, God is going to bless you. And my mind was thinking, I just need to be delivered. I don't, my, I had enough of God to be scared of going to hell. Come on. That's the only thing that kept me from taking my life because I knew that hell was real. Yeah. And I knew that the second I'd done it, I would open up my eyes in hell. But after all those years, when I was 19 years old, I, my mom invited me to a tent revival in Birdstown. And I, at that time, I went to a large charismatic church where everything was praise and worship. And I, I was 19, I didn't care anything about southern gospel music or country <laughs> churches. <laughs> And my mom kept begging me to go and begging me to go. And I told her that if she would buy me a dress, I, I would go. And she did. And I'm, I'm so thankful that she did. Amen. Amen. Come on. Even though it, I told her to bribe me, basically. I went. And that first night we were underneath that tent. It was in June. It was hot. And it would come one of those. Summer downpours, <laughs> just suddenly, no warning, it just poured Hello. the rain. Hello. And they had to take all the equipment and take it inside to a basement that was probably about just from here back. <laughs> and it was just crammed jam full, yeah. jam-packed. People were standing, and there was no room. And Brother Paul was the minister that night. And after... Everything after everybody got in there, he walked back outside and he picked up a handful of mud. He smeared it all over his face, all down his suit, and he said, "There's somebody here." He said, "On the outside, you look like a perfect Christian." Oh my! He said, "But your inside looks like this." He said, "You have a spirit of suicide on your life, and God sent me here to tell you that you'll live and you'll not die." Well, come on! Praise God! And the very next night. That word just got implanted in me, and I knew that I had to come back. I knew that I couldn't go on the way that I was going on. And we come back the next night, we was back underneath the tent. Nobody had to lay hands on me. Come on, come on. Nobody had to rub oil all over my face come on. and shake my head until come I on. thought my neck was going to break. Ah, God right. sat me in that seat. All right. And he began to pour out his anointing on me. Uh, yes. And I felt like my insides were just jerking. And I remember sitting there thinking, I prayed, and I was like, God, what are you doing? <laughs> he told me, he said, I'm cleaning you Come out. On, well. And I felt literally like a scrub brush was on my insides, <laughs> cleaning everything out. And I sit there underneath that tent, and God miraculously delivered me, yes. set me free. And as I look back and I've thought on it many times, I always thought it was the most interesting thing that they didn't have a big fancy tent. They borrowed some tents from a funeral home. Yeah. <laughs> Come and on. God gave me a reason to live underneath a funeral tent. <laughs> well, I appreciate Miss Tristan. I let her know it.